With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woo a hand clapper, a high-fiver. I kind of like the high-five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At ChumbaCasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. When we started doing anything but footy podcast, it was all about trying to highlight some of the achievements of people who, in our eyes, were superstars. Week in, week out. Not just once every four years. People like Ali and Johnny Brownlee, the double Olympic triathlon champion and double Olympic medalist, invariably behind his brother. When we launched our Anything But Footy spin-off, Great British Bosses, we wanted to get behind the scenes of as many Olympic and Paralympic sports, see how decisions were made, and talk to the people who help make the British success happen. So we're delighted in our sixth and final one of the first series of Hashtag GB Bosses. We're talking triathlon. The Brits are the joint most successful triathlon nation at the Olympics, won four medals at the first ever para-triathlon events in Rio, and triathlon is one of the fastest growing participation sports in the UK. Not bad for a sport invented in the 70s. I'm John. And I'm Michael. And John and I have a combined four decades of experience broadcasting about big sports stories, and at all the major sporting events. We've reported on the Olympic Games, the Paralympics, the Commonwealth Games, Rugby and Cricket World Cups, Wimbledon, the Open, and World and European Championships in athletics, swimming, and cycling, amongst others. We also co-host the weekly podcast Anything But Footy, about Olympic and Paralympic sport, which gets over 1,000 downloads every month. And for this episode of Great British Bosses, we're in Loughborough. And I'm Andy Salmon, and I'm the Chief Executive of British Triathlon. Andy, firstly, thank you for having us. It's, it's nice pleasure. to be here. The weather is horrific. Um, but I, I suppose it's quite apt that I swam my way here. <laughs> um, how I mentioned about the sport started in, in the 70s, I really didn't know that much about it until really 2012 came along, I'll be honest. I know that it came in in the sure. Olympics in, in Sydney. But firstly, what is the beauty of triathlon in your eyes? I guess it depends on your perspective a little bit, but from my point of view as an administrator, I love the fact that it was invented in the 70s in San Diego. It's super cool. It's very fresh. One of the things we're really proud of in our sport is that we have gender equality. So right from the, from the get-go, female athletes were paid the same prize money as male athletes, and that's something that's continued, and that's something that, you know, if you look at the sport now, we're very, very proud of our, our gender profile. Um, so, yeah, it's a huge amount to be, to be really excited about, but just that, that freshness, that, that, that um, beginning of, of the journey that we're on, you know, we're still growing very, very quickly because we're very much on the steep part of that, of that growth curve that, that we're seeing at the moment. And I mentioned it's one of the most participated sports in the country. You've got plans, I'm assuming, to grow even further. Absolutely. One of the things you know we keep talking about internally here is whilst we are growing significantly, we mustn't be complacent. And because we're a young sport, you know, if you compare us to a sport that might be 100, 150 years old, you know, we're not in the same place. So yes, we're making hay while the sun's shining, but let's work really, really hard to make sure that growth continues. So yeah, we've got some really ambitious plans to introduce more children to the sport, to grow our membership significantly. So yeah, it really is an exciting time. What would you say your your main role is at British Triathlon? Because when we've been doing this series of Great British Bosses, for example, British Swimming, British Athletics are there to deliver elite medals. British Gymnastics, England Badminton, 
they're there to deliver an elite program, but they have a grassroots and mass mm-hmm. participation uh, lookout and remit as well. What is your remit then? Yeah, so really the remit is is everything. Um, without getting too complicated, here at Loughborough we have uh, British Triathlon and Triathlon England, and therefore we have responsibility for the entire sport from cradle to grave, literally. So within our Triathlon England operation, we're really concerned with increasing participation, introducing people to the sport, developing clubs, working with our regions, and then watching those those young athletes who show some talent to develop that talent so they can progress into the British triathlon sphere where we really develop that talent even further onto our world-class programme and aspire to, to compete in the Paralympics and the Olympic Games. And you mentioned gender equality right at the start, obviously something that, that's clearly important. How big an issue then in, in some other sports is that gender inequality? I think it's very easy for us to be sanctimonious in in triathlon and we try very hard not to be. Um, It's back to that point I made at the beginning. Because we were invented in the 70s, I think we had the opportunity to set our stall out. My career past was spent in golf. You probably couldn't find a more different sport, which was invented hundreds of years ago in cold, damp, dreary Scotland. Um, So contrast that with San Diego in the 70s, you you get where I'm going. Um, So it's been easy for us to set our stall out in the way that we have. uh, And so I'd be very hesitant to be critical of other sports, but I would still challenge other sports. You know, diversity is, is is a huge topic in sport, not just gender diversity, but all forms of diversity. And we haven't cracked all of them either. Um, but we need to work harder and harder at that. Yeah, I was going to ask, is there still work to do? And if so, what work? Yeah, so you know, we, we, we pride ourselves on, on being inclusive. Um, but you know, if you go along to a triathlon event next summer, you'll see lots of middle-aged white men and women. Uh, so we're working very hard um, at being inclusive for BAME. Uh, and we're making progress. That starts with leadership. So now, for example, 20% of our Triathlon England board come from a BAME background. So that's really good. So that's the beginning. Um, we now then need to look at the the, um, the imagery that we use on our website and our news stories and make sure that the people from the BAME community can see that this is a sport that they can do. Um, the same for LGBTQ+, and, and, and all the other um, forms of diversity that we're concerned with. There's, there's, a, there's still a lot to do um, yeah, in those areas. Before we talk more about British triathlon and, and the aims and obviously Tokyo coming up, a bit about you because this is about GB Boss. So sure. you, you've been in the industry for 25 years and you mentioned golf. So how, did, how do you end up being the CEO of British triathlon? <laughs> I, think, I think so, so often like you know, this sort of happens in life, doesn't it? It was literally a, a, a shoestring moment where I, I was a golfer, I worked in golf, did a bit of running. Some friends asked me to come along and do a triathlon relay and I did the relay, uh, the, sorry, the running um, leg of the relay. I couldn't swim at that time, and I didn't own a bike. Uh, and it sounds a bit, a bit corny and a bit cheesy, but I was literally inspired. It was a half Ironman um, event up in Scotland, and I was so inspired. I said to my wife, I'm going to do this race next year. So luckily, she was a very good swimmer. She taught me how to swim. I went out and bought a bike. When you say you couldn't swim, you couldn't swim at all or you'd never done open water swimming I, I yeah I, I could I could paddle from one end to the other with with some form of breaststroke I couldn't do front crawl I couldn't do a length of front crawl I would drown before I got to the other end of the pool um so she taught me to swim bought a bike um and I did that half Ironman the following year uh and I set myself a target of six hours and I did five hours 59 minutes and 57 seconds so I was pretty chuffed with that well, well, well done <laughs> and and you mentioned Ironman this is something that I struggle with. What's the difference between the Ironman competitions and triathlon? Yeah, and I just made the mistake there of using that term flippantly. Ironman is a brand. Uh, so there's an organization that owns that brand that run races um, and, they, and they do half Ironman or, and then full Ironman. Um, outside of that brand, you would call that long distance or half distance or middle distance um, triathlon. So it's just a brand, but it's a very iconic brand. And they have their world final in, in Kona in Hawaii um, every year in October. So you've outlined your credentials as far as triathlon is concerned. But how do you come to this role then? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd hasten to add, I'm not very good at triathlon. So my credentials only go so far. <laughs> Better than us. Come but, <laughs> Yeah, no, quite literally, I, I, you know, that, that day was, was a real life changer because I, you know, I got the bug. I started to compete in triathlons and, and improve um, from being terrible to just not very good. Um, and then the opportunity came up in, in Scotland where I lived to be uh, the chair of the board of Triathlon Scotland. 
So I thought, well, I'm not really sure, but you know, I'm a, I'm a golfy guy. I'll give it a go. And and they 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 chose to take a risk and, and take me on. So I did that for a few years, and then after a couple of years, um, the Scotland board asked me to represent them on the British board. So I joined the British board when Jack Buckner was the chief executive. Uh, and so I, I guess I'd had a little bit of a head start when the opportunity came up when Jack moved on to go to British Swimming. Um, I thought long and hard about it, and I thought, you know, here's a sport I love. I, um, I love everything about it. I love the culture. I love the atmosphere. Why not? And unfortunately, the, the board took a took a chance and, and appointed me just over two years ago. When you arrived at British Triathlon as a, a CEO and you walk into your glass walled office, what are the challenges that present themselves? What did you sit down on day one and think, this is what I need to tackle here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. And, and you know, how long have you got? I, I think there are the really practical responsibilities that you have as a CEO. So do we have enough money in the bank? What are our future projections? What are our reserve levels? That type of thing. What are our relationships like with our, our partners, both our commercial partners and our, and our key partners, UK Sport and Sport England? Um, but for me, it's always the first thing is always about the people. Um, so it was a, an opportunity to really to get to know the people that worked here. Um, assess how clear they were about the direction of travel uh, and, and they weren't that clear. So my, my first real objective was to clarify our sense of purpose as an organisation and then um, on the back of that to establish some really meaningful organisational values that the team, and when I say the team I don't just mean the staff team, I mean the volunteers, the boards and so on. We did workshops all around the country, developed our organisational values and that formed what I'm really quite proud of is a one-page strategy which lays out what we're all about. One page. Well one done. page. One page of A4. That, that was my goal right from the start. <laughs> Apart from making it meaningful and impactful, it, it needed to be memorable and you know, succinct. So our, our vision is, is six words. So most of us can remember those, those six words. Um, great experiences through swim, bike, run. That, that is, our, is our vision. Um, and so I think you know, if you ask me to really distill what, what is my key responsibility is to set that direction of travel and align everybody to that direction of travel, and you know, we're making good progress. Is it fair to say that you guys put on events as well? Um, so obviously, everyone knows about the Leeds, or should know about the Leeds um, event, the World Triathlon yeah. Series yeah. event there. There's the the relay event in Nottingham. And then I think uh, you, you're, you're kind of doing some road shows over the next kind of few weeks about trying to, to get local authorities to maybe look at triathlons you know you you look at any weekend in this country in your local town there's a 10k yeah. or a half marathon yeah. is that something that you want swim bike run to be happening right across the uk yeah triathlons are very event realized sport you know you don't come home from work and say oh, i'll just go and do a triathlon yeah you, you go and train and you, you know and at the weekend you might go and compete so triathlon events are critical for us to the first part of your question we don't deliver very many events at all but we do deliver some really key events. So the World Triathlon Series event in Leeds next year is, is absolutely you know, fundamental and at the core of our event strategy. Um, we then have other events where we either appeal to a corporate market, um, like the Accenture um, corporate race in, in Canary Wharf in London that we've done for the last two years. And then we have what we call the Big Weekend, which is at Mallory Park, where we bring together the, the sort of developing talent from around all three home countries. To compete so so we deal with those types of events but the vast majority of events out there in the marketplace are delivered by clubs by commercial race organizers and they're the people we really want to support so the workshops that we're doing over the next couple of weeks are all about supporting those race organizers and they come in all different shapes and sizes to again back to our vision if we want people to have great experiences through swim bike run we can't do that all ourselves. We need those race organisers, those event organisers, to provide those great experiences. So our job is very much to support them to, to do that. And, and looking at the stats, um, I believe the triathlon business to the UK economy is worth £445 million, pounds, and that's a 50% increase since 2012. And that goes to show what I said right at the start, which is I didn't know anything about triathlon before 2012, and now it's just literally you know, skyrocketing. Yeah, and you know, as I say, long may that continue, but it won't continue unless we continue to work really, really hard. And you know, we're very fortunate we get fantastic investment from UK Sport and Sport England, but we need to put that investment to good work and not just spend it, but suspend it in a way that's sustainable so that if, you know, God forbid that, that funding source dries up in the future, the sport can carry on growing um, even without it. And how important 
is that event in Leeds? Because obviously it was in London. You moved it to Leeds, I suspect, because we had Alistair and Johnny Brownlee who were, were based there along with a lot of other triathletes. But the fact that, and I've covered that event for, for radio every year it's happened, mm-hmm. the fact that thousands go to Round Hay Park, thousands line that route, and then thousands come not just into the, the seats in Millennium Square, but all around the city centre. Mm-hmm. So how important is that event and, and being away and out of London? Yeah, it wasn't so much about how can we get away from London, but clearly running, running races in, in London is incredibly expensive. So that, that was a consideration. You're quite right, you know, the, the success of the Brownleys was a real factor. Um, it, before my time, but I know, was a real factor in bringing the race um, up to Leeds. But also in Leeds City Council, we have a phenomenally good partner. You know, they, they, they really, along with the support from, from UK Sport and our commercial partners, make that event possible. And uh, the people of Leeds as well? People of Leeds, I just, you know, we get you know, anything up to 70,000, 80,000 people lining the streets. To put, to, you know, the weather was pretty awful last year, but, you know, it's been pretty good previous years. Um, the atmosphere there is, is absolutely electric. And, and actually, you know, to your question about how important is the event, it's not just important in the UK. It's important globally. So the ITU, the International Federation for Triathlon, for the second year have said, and I think they're being pretty honest with us, have said, you know, this is the best race on the, on the series. And what they really love about it is that city centre atmosphere and the buzz, you know, throughout the when, the, when the athletes are lapping on the bike and the run, the atmosphere that you've both experienced um, is second to none. And, and they really value that. And before we go on to talk more about some of your, your big names, the Brownleys, inevitably, for a sport that, you know, only came into the Olympics in 2000, you mentioned 70 to 80,000. That's equivalent of Wembley Stadium isn't it that's a Wembley Stadium triathlon event to put that into yeah. vernacular that people might understand from football or rugby yeah it's interesting I've never thought about it in those terms but you're, you're spot on and the other unique thing is that you know those those fans or, the, or those, the relatives of those fans can't go and have a game of football on the turf at Wembley where of course in Leeds you know the whole race encompasses a weekend so all throughout Saturday and Sunday morning We've got people like you and I taking part, and, and on Sunday... More you than me, <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> well, we'll sign you up for next year. <laughs> I'm better talking about it than I am doing it. So, yeah, we're, that, that, that's very much part of the, you know, the, the magic of, of, of triathlon, is that we've got you know, ordinary punters like me, then, let's say that, <laughs> taking part. But then we've got this other phenomenon called age, age group. You know, we've, we've got these amazing age group athletes who are people who have full-time jobs and busy lives, families and what have you, but they train and they get to a standard where they can, they can compete for GB and they, they come along and race on the same course as the elite athletes. It's, it's quite a sight. Yeah, and on the same day, as well as the likes of Ali and, and Johnny Brownlee in the men's race and the likes of Non Stanford, Vicky Holland, Jess Learmont, Georgia Taylor Brown in the women's race. You don't get to have a kick about do you with Harry Kane and you don't get to, to throw a rugby ball about do you but you can go and line up on the same pontoon in Round Hay Park as the triathletes it, 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 exactly exactly and finish on that same blue carpet and you know that, that amazing feeling when you finish that cross that finish line is uh, yeah you can't do that in every sport as you say so this year Ali Brownlee crossed the line in Leeds and said I'm he done t- he <laughs> told me he was retiring <laughs> Where was your heart in your mouth at that point as, well, as head of British triathlon? This is the double Olympic <laughs> champion. Luckily, I wasn't there. And I didn't hear it live, but it was relayed to me shortly afterwards. And uh, yeah, I think I think Ali's yeah that was a, that was a low spot for him. Clearly, he's had a tough year, eighteen months. Um, but he's such a phenomenal athlete. Yeah, not not just in terms of what he's achieved, but his ability to to push himself to do things that most people would logically say shouldn't be possible. And he seems to be able to do that. Um, so thankfully he's not retired and I hope he's not going to retire for, for quite some time yet to come. So the all important question is, is he going to put himself forward to go to Tokyo? Well, yeah, that's the question we're all asking, isn't it? Uh, and I don't know the answer. Um, I would love him to make himself available. Of course, we haven't selected the team yet for, for Tokyo, either on the men's or the women's side or, or indeed the Paralympic team. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, a, a double gold Olympic medalist, the opportunity to do something so special and coming back for a third gold medal and indeed win a fourth medal in the relay um, if he were selected for the for the relay team let's just hope that's just too much for him to ignore and and he'll he'll put himself forward and you mentioned that that relay this is again showing triathlon growing for the first time is a, a mixed relay at the at the olympics so potentially ali could go but just be part of the team um or as you say he could go and try and defend his title 
Yeah, we're, we're so excited about the relay. You know, when you when you look at some of the key championship races over the last eighteen months to two years that have involved relay, actually some of the TV audiences have been greater for the relay race than they have for the individual race. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure you, you guys have witnessed it as well. It's so exciting. It's so dynamic. And the, and the race, you know, often in individual triathlon over Olympic distance, the criticism that there is, is one is that if you get a big breakaway group on the bike, it can kind of rule half the field out of the race. But in relay, it just seems to ebb and flow so, so quickly. And at the um, Olympic test event in, in Tokyo this year, we had the most phenomenal finish with Alex Yi running the last leg for us. And you know, Jess had done an absolutely blinding first leg and built up a great lead. Unfortunately, um, Jess, um, Georgia wasn't, wasn't feeling so well and, and she lost a bit of that lead and then Alex had that last leg and he was competing with the, with the French in a sprint finish and you just, that just brought to life just how exciting it is and I think you know, the ITU are so they're to be congratulated first of all for pushing the IOC to include mixed relay in, in the games I think it's just a real fillip in the arm for the, for the sport and it also means for the sport of triathlon and you as head of GB triathlon you know the joint most successful Olympic uh, you know, in, in the Olympics means that people can win multiple medals. It's, you know, in swimming, you know, where you you can win three or four medals, um, you know, while you're out there, sometimes in athletics as well. It's great to see that, that they can become bigger than just an Olympic champion. They can be, you know, a, a two-time Ex- Olympic champion. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, there's, there's early, early stage discussions going on with the IOC about adding another race format you know hopefully for Paris maybe but if not for Los Angeles so you know there could be potentially um, three medal opportunities or perhaps the opportunity for us to take a bigger team and you mentioned obviously Alistair and Jonathan Brownlee there are other men the likes of Alex Yee who you mentioned Gordon Benson and others but the strength in depth with the British women surely the biggest task there is going to be selecting your team not just for the individual event but then for for that mixed relay as well because you've got Non Stanford, you've got um, Vicky Holland, both have yeah. been world champions, of course. Yeah. You've got Jess Learmont, Georgia Taylor Brown on the, the podium several times in the World Series. There's a, a lot of very good British women doing triathlon yeah. at the minute. Yeah. No, it, it's, it, it's so exciting for so many reasons. You know, just before I started, when I was being interviewed for this job, people were really talking very, very clearly about concerns. You know, what, what does life look like when the Brownleys retire? You know, where, where's the next role model coming from? And all of a sudden, you know, we've got six or seven female British athletes who are capable of going to Tokyo and, and being really competitive. And that's fantastic. And over the last two years of racing, there have been so many great images of, of us where we had you know, four athletes in the top five or six during the run and that type of thing. And really iconic. And you talk about role models and inspiring the next generation. You know, that, that, that just does it all. And, and so many of those female athletes as well have come through we use this word pathway all the time in sport, but you know they've come through our programs, through our talent development programs. So it's it's really great to see. So you're pretty confident there's life in British triathlon when when Johnny and Alistair hang up the bike, the the goggles and the trainers. Yeah, you know we've got some really talented young guys coming through. Yeah, you, you, know, you mentioned uh, Alex Yee, and you know his when, when he's in full flight on the run, he's he's a sight to behold, and he's such a such a great character as well. And people like Ben Dystra. Uh, Tom Bishop, Gordon Benson, you know, there's, there's more depth there than perhaps some people will realise, uh, and lots and lots of talent coming through the Home Nation programme. So, you know, you know, things do go in cycles a little bit, but um, will there ever, ever be another Alistair and Johnny Brownlee? Maybe, maybe not, but there's certainly a, a plethora of talent coming through. John mentioned, obviously, his first kind of introduction to triathlon was, was in the lead-up to London and 2012. I can remember sitting up in the middle of the night watching it in in Sydney I can remember in the build-up to the Sydney games that Tim Don was was really Mm -hmm. someone a lot of people were predicting was going to win a medal the other narrative ahead of Sydney was that there were going to be sharks (laughs) in Sydney (laughs) Harbour and they were going to eat the eat the triathletes that the narrative of course in Rio was about water quality and and whether that was going to be an issue have you got any concerns ahead of Tokyo Obviously, we've seen marathons and the race walks moved because sure. of the heat. Sure. Do you have any concerns about temperature, water quality? Yeah, I mean, athlete welfare is always the first consideration. You know, of, of course, we're in a serious business of preparing athletes so that they can go ahead and win medals, both Olympic and Paralympic. But athlete welfare comes first. We were out in, in Tokyo this August for the, for the test event. And I, I have to say, the night before the, the women's race, I lost some sleep worrying about athlete welfare. Because you know, when, you, when you're out there yourself and you feel that 
oppressive heat and humidity, you can't help but be worried. But what I, what I saw, I guess, were two things. I saw the International Federation, the ITU, doing its absolute utmost to look out for athlete welfare, and they made some tough decisions. For example, they reduced the women's race to 5K. Now, I know, you know some of our female athletes, Vicky in particular, felt so good that she was actually really disappointed with that decision because she felt if it had been a 10K race, she would have gone on and she, you know, she was catching up with the athletes in front of her. But the other thing that, that I took real pleasure from was to see just how well prepared our athletes were, both our Paralympic and our Olympic athletes. You know, they really were ahead of their competitors in how prepared they were for those hot and humid conditions. Um, so, so, so that was really gratifying. But as I say, it, it, first and foremost, it's about athlete welfare. We saw on the um, Saturday with the para racing, uh, what, what appeared to be a very late last minute decision. It was always going to be a last minute decision to move the race to duathlon. Now for some of our para, well, for all of our para triathletes, that's a massively significant decision, but for some more than others. And you know, one or two of those athletes had never done a duathlon before. And depending on the disability that they have, to actually run twice is, is a hell of an ask of, of somebody. But they coped brilliantly, and, 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 and the results were really good. It wasn't, that event wasn't all about results. It was about how well prepared we were for those conditions. So we were very gratified. But, um, yeah, I, I'm satisfied to your question. that I, I think the IT have done everything they can to, to take into account those, those weather conditions. There's more that will be done. We know that will be done that wasn't done for the test event, that will be done for the race um, next August. Does it then surprise you the IOC have said, well, we're going to move the marathon and race walk? Um, I, su- I suppose to some extent it surprises me. You know, I, 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 try, and, I try and focus on, you know, the con- well, it's not even the controllables, but, you know, what, what's in my realm of, of, of influence. And, yeah, it, it, of course it's relevant that the marathon and the walk have been moved to, to, to somewhere where, where it's going to be a little bit cooler. Um, but triathlon is very different. You know, the, 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 the temperature and the quality of the water is really, really significant for us. That, you know, that clearly isn't a consideration in a marathon or a walk. And, you know, the, the, the temperature of the water influencing how hot or otherwise those athletes are when they come out of the water is, is absolutely essential in, in, in triathlon. So that's what it's all about. Let me talk to you then about Jess Learmonth and Georgia Taylor-Brown and crossing the line hand in hand in Tokyo. It obviously got quite a lot of coverage, quite a lot of column inches. How did they not know the rules? Well, clearly they, they didn't know the rules. I thought, I thought you might mention this, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, w- I was literally right there at the, at the finish line. I thought, what a, what a, what a great moment. You know, we've, we've, we've shown that we've got the one and you know, the top, top two athletes on the, on the day. And then of course the, the logic kicked in and the rules, and, and the rules were applied correctly by the ITU, first of all. They got it right, didn't they? They got it right, yeah. I know there was a lot of chat afterwards about whether or not they did, but they got it right. They interpreted the rules correctly. The rule was there for a purpose um, to, to ensure that there's proper competition. Um, so the girls didn't know the rule, that, that, that was clear. Um, they accept a certain amount of responsibility for not knowing the rule. Every athlete should know the rules, but we also accept responsibility and we will be working harder in the future to make sure that all of our athletes are aware of all of the rules. Because obviously we'd had the situation the previous year with the Brownlee brothers where one threw the other across the line. So you presume that Alistair was aware of what would have happened if he'd, if he'd carried his brother over the line. Yeah, although sli- slightly different, those, those two things are often muddled up. They're actually quite different things. So uh, the Alistair Johnny thing in Cozumel in 2016 was about helping another athlete across the finish line, whereas this one was about not competing across the finish line. So both, both are addressed separately within the ITU um, rulebook. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, as I said earlier, we, we, took a, we took our teams to Tokyo to prepare for 2020. We didn't, you know, the results were, were clearly of, of relevance. But whether we came first and second or, or crossed the finish line first and second and were disqualified from a performance point of view wasn't essential. It was really disappointing and challenging f- for the girls because they lost some prize money. And, and that's, that's a real shame. Um, and it was a, a painful lesson to learn. And I can remember being in Rio at the Olympics at the Copacabana, watching the women's triathlon there, and you had the two housemates, Vicky Holland and Non Stanford, yeah. racing for a bronze medal. And I remember interviewing Vicky afterwards and saying, well, why didn't you cross the line together? You could have... And she explained to me then, she yeah. said, no, well, you know, the rules are... Yeah. You can't do that. Pretty yeah. awkward conversation, I imagine, though, when they got back home, wasn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing is uh, we've got great team spirit within within you know, the, the, the athletes. They, they, the, those, those two train together up in Leeds, um, so they know each other really well. They're great friends. So I, you know, I, I saw them later that evening. They were having dinner together, so it couldn't have been too difficult a conversation, I don't think. Uh, looking ahead to the Tokyo 2020, medal target? Ha ha. So para, let's start with the Paralympics. Um, we're, we're in a really great place with the, with the Paralympics. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for six medals. Wow. Six medals, yeah. In and the just, Paralympics. In the Paralympics. And the Olympics. Olympics, I'm going to go for two. Just on the Paralympics, you're obviously a new sport in Rio. Is there any advice for people like para badminton who are going to, to Tokyo for the first time um, as a sport? You know, the Paralympics are a different whole kettle of fish yeah. to their normal tournaments. Yeah. Do you know, I, I think if I tried to give somebody running a performance program at another sport any advice around performance, they would probably laugh at me. So I'm not even going to go, I'm not even going to go there. I think what I would say though to the, to the whole, whole sport, you know, the whole organization, is don't underestimate the opportunity that it presents to raise the profile of your sport and to send out a really clear message that your sport is accessible and inclusive. Um, certainly from, from our para triathletes, um, they, they, they don't like the word inspiring, but I find them incredibly inspiring. I love to spend a little bit of time with them from time to time. Some of them have come along and talked with our commercial partners, with our all staff meetings, and they inspire the people in, in those rooms. The stories they have to tell are phenomenal. Um, some of the adversity that they've had to overcome. Um, so their ability to inspire people to take up badminton or to take up triathlon who might not otherwise do is, is underestimated constantly, I think, in sport. And we try hard not to do that in, in triathlon. And then you mentioned two medals for the Olympics. Male, female? Oh, come on, you're, you're, put, <laughs> oh, you're going to put me on the spot now. So yeah, I'm, yeah two, two medals in the, in the women's race. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm hopeful for the, for the mixed relay, but, uh, but I'm not taking it for granted. Well, Andy Salmon, CEO of British Triathlon, thank you very much for talking to great British bosses. You're very welcome. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Sports Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.